Welcome to Tree Week, everyone. It's like Lori said, it's uh, Tree Week 2020, and we have a vast amount of webinars all week long for you. Some are 11, some are 12, but if you've registered for them, you should get an email that tells you when those are. I'd like to introduce Lori Thomas. Uh, she's an extension forester in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources, and she's going to be doing a webinar today on Tree ID, which is always a big, a big thing people want to know about. Yeah, thank you, Renee. I appreciate that very much. Um, and again, like Renee said, welcome to Tree Week 2020. Um, I, I feel like Kentucky is a really blessed state with um, an abundance and a great diversity of trees here, um, which can make tree ID a little challenging. But I think this is a great way to kind of kick off, well, sort of kick off. I know Tree Week started on the weekend, but sort of kick off Tree Week, starting with some tree identification, learning to identify this extremely valuable resource we have out there. So today what I plan to do is <clears throat> over the, about the next 35 to 45 minutes is go over some of the basics of tree identification, looking at some of those characteristics of those trees, um, of the leaves specifically, and how to use a tool that can make tree ID a little easier for you because it can be really challenging in um, this very diverse state. So, all right, with that, I think I will start to share my screen. And here we go. Let me optimize. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so identifying Kentucky's trees. Like I said, a great way to kick off a tree week. And right now the trees are looking really nice. We can see this great white oak right here. This is a beautiful, some beautiful fall coloration and we're seeing some really pretty fall colors this year. So hopefully you all get a chance to get out and enjoy the colors and do a little tree ID too. But before we kind of get jump right into tree identification, um, I want to talk a little bit about the trees as a group. Um, and I know you all can't answer, I can't see your chat pod anyway, but um, just kind of think about this. What percent of Kentucky do you think is forested? As you all are thinking about that, I'm going to pop that up for you. So about how much of the state do you think is forested? Well, about half of our state is covered in forest land, and that equate runs out to about 12.4 million acres. And you'll notice in this nice map of Kentucky that the eastern half of our state is heavily forested, which makes sense. You know, it's very rugged, rugged, rough terrain. Not a lot of farming can happen there. So it's a great place to grow trees, and a lot of trees do grow there. And I wanted to point out this part on the map too. This little line that I'm moving the cursor up and down, this is the Daniel Boone National Forest. And this is one of our national, this is our national forest here in the state. And then if we move across the state all the way over to the western part of the state, we've got um, the land between the lakes right there. And this is the land between the lakes national recreation area. And it's also managed by the US Forest Service. But for the most part of all of this forest land we're looking at in the state, most of it is privately owned and by individuals or small groups of people. So about 80% of our forest land is privately owned. So learning about and understanding trees, how to protect them and how to manage them sustainably is very important, which is part of our mission in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. All right, so let me ask you this, how many different kinds of trees do you think we have in Kentucky? As I said, Kentucky's very diverse and doing tree ID can be challenging in the state. So if you all have got a number, I'll pop up a number. We have more than 120 different tree species in the state. So as you can imagine, that can be really difficult um, to kind of break into learning how to identify these. I know I was daunted when I took dendrology in college and our professor, Dr. Kimmerer, told us you will be learning uh, at least 120 different tree species. And we're just like, oh no, will we ever remember that? But he showed us how to use this great tool, which I'm gonna show you how to use. And that made some of that tree identification easier for us. So we have 120 different tree species. And as you can imagine, if I, I'll back up so you can actually see this, the map, our state where it's located north to south um, contributes to this diversity and how we are east to west, we've got the mountains in the east. So we've got a very different type of habitat there all the way um, over to over here on the Mississippi River. So we've got a lot of diversity because our state is 
long and narrow and east to west, we've got a lot of different um, habitat or eco regions there. So that contributes to our diversity in the state. And according to the Kentucky Division of Forestry, we're second only to Florida in diversity of trees in the state. I'll move on back down. Okay, so why are trees important? This is Tree Week. This is a whole week to celebrate trees and how important they are to us and what we can do to manage them in a sustainable way. So I'll just pop up some pictures, joggle memories here. I'm sure you all, all have been thinking of these. Yeah, so here we go. Trees are important. A biggie is they take in carbon dioxide. They're carbon sinks. They get it out of the atmosphere and they release oxygen, which is vitally important for all of us and wildlife as well. So trees are, they, they clean the air. That picture represents that. So trees um, take in carbon, give off oxygen. They also help provide clean water. And if we look at the picture up here in the top, these trees growing along the stream here, it's important to have trees along our waterways, um, our ponds, our rivers, lakes, streams, because they help stabilize that soil. And that keeps that soil from, keeps it out of the water. And they also provide um, sh shade over those streams, which in, then in turn provides better habitat for our macro invertebrates, those insects that are in the water that our fish like to eat. So we're having those trees around the streams are important for improving habitat and it helps prevent soil erosion. And then we've got <clears throat> trees or habitat for wildlife. Not only do they provide homes, but they provide a lot of the food, if not most of the food that our wildlife eat. So trees are very important for our wildlife. And here's one you probably thought of because I know we all like to go out for a walk in the woods, either even if it's just a local park with a wooded area in it or take a bike ride or some of us might like to horseback ride. Trees are, those forests, you know, the trees collectively are the forest are really important for recreation. And that's, that's important for us, being able to get out and be with nature we know um, is beneficial to our health, it's beneficial to our mental and physical health. And they're also um, having those recreation areas are also a great contribution to our economy in this state. We have the Daniel Boone National Forest, we've got all of our state parks, we have the land between the lakes, the Jefferson Memorial Forest. Those are areas of recreation and they do contribute to the economy in this state. And then lastly, products. So there are well over 2,000 products that are made from trees. And you can see that the photo is kind of small, but you can see the typical ones we think of wood. All the wood things, you know, we build our homes out of it. We have flooring in our homes. Um, and you know all kinds of stuff that we build with that. But then there's things like our pellets um, and we even get plastics and we get some food products that come from some of either the fibers in the tree or for the plastics, some of those and um, the chemicals that are bound up in the tree. So there's well over 2000 products that come from trees. And I just wanted to point out that um, if you get a chance, uh, take a look at our website, um, Forestry Natural Resources website, and take a look at the um, Forestry Sector Economic Report for um, 2019. In 2019, the forestry sector in Kentucky, which includes logging, um, primary and secondary wood products, um, paper, pulp and fiber, and um, wood residue, contributed over $13.2 billion to our economy in 2019 and provided more than 28,000 direct jobs in those fields. So the forestry sector is important to our economy um, as well as the trees and all of the, all of the very important vital ecosystem services they provide us. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about why they're so important. Now let's get down to identifying some of these trees. So in the process of identifying trees, there's a logical sequence to identify the tree of interest. And that is a tool that we can use and it's called a dichotomous key. And I know many of you, because I recognize some of your names that popped up in there, probably have used dichotomous keys in the past. And they make dichotomous keys for rocks, seashells, um, flowers, insects. We're gonna use one today for tree leaves. Um, they also make them for tree buds and twigs if you don't have leaves as well. So today that's what we're gonna practice with is our dichotomous key. Di means two. So all of us, when we go through this key, you'll notice everything's set up in twos. You'll answer, you'll read two statements, two questions, and it's gonna send you to another set of two questions or two statements, slowly narrowing it down, taking it to that tree of interest. 
And the one we're going to practice with today is um, the tree finder and the manual for identification of trees. And that's um, by May Watts. It was put out back in the early 60s, but it's a great little resource. You can, I like it and I use it a lot for programming. One, because it's small, it's hand pocket size. Um, and um, it's inexpensive. You can get them about $5 off Amazon. And it has most of the trees we're going to encounter east of the Mississippi. So it's good for us. Now, if you go out west, this, you know, the western part of the country, it wouldn't be very useful, but it's useful here. And it doesn't have everything we have here. It's got 70, 75 plus trees, but it's got the bulk of them. So it's a nice, inexpensive little resource to use, and it's easy to carry out in the field. That's what I really like about it. Just stick it in your pocket, not carrying one of the big field guides. All right, so when we're doing tree identification, we're gonna look at the characteristics of that tree. Each species of trees has a set of characteristics that help identify it. And as you can think of, leaves would be an obvious one. And this is a great time. We still have leaves on the tree. So you can actually get out and use a dichotomous key right now, um, leaf key to identify trees. It's one of those two, the leaves are usually pretty easy to get to. Um, they're in abundance and they're the whole pretty close to keeping those characteristics the same within a species. So it's a really good, um, a really good characteristic to use. Plus we have it for an extended period of time. Then we can use twigs and buds come winter time when all the leaves fall off the tree, at least for our deciduous trees. And Kentucky is made up of mostly deciduous trees. We're known as an oak hickory forest here. But as those leaves um, change colors, which they're doing right now, uh, and fall, you can still identify trees with the twigs and buds. And the tree finder, the manual that we're using, they make one. It's the winter tree ID guide, and it's for twigs and buds. You can use flowers, or they can help confirm an identification. Um, but that's, again, a seasonal thing. We're only going to have those in the spring into the early summer. We can also use the fruit, again, seasonal, good for confirmation. And it's one of those that's gonna be more of a seasonal thing too in the late summer and into the fall. And then there's bark. And bark can be helpful on if we have a few species that have very distinctive bark. Um, but for the most part, as a tree grows, that bark, the characteristics may change on that tree. And that makes sense. You know, it's getting bigger. So that bark's splitting apart into plates and whatnot. But we do have a few trees that you can, bark is a really good um, identification or characteristic to, for identification. And here's one, this is our American sycamore. Um, uh, we always learned it as having camouflage bark. It's brown and kind of scaly down at the bottom. And then as you move further up those limbs, um, that brown scaly bark is peeled away um, showing the uh, white inner bark underneath there. So it makes it, you can identify these trees from a distance, don't even need to go up to see the leaves. Another one, I don't have a picture of it, is would be a hackberry. And then for those of you more in the central part of the state, you're familiar with hackberry probably, and they have that, it looks like the bark has warts all over it. So those are two that um, bark can be useful, but for the most part, the leaves are the way to go. And if you're new to tree identification, that's the place to start for sure. So let's talk, ooh, before we talk more about leaves, wanted to point out a warning. All leaves of the same species and even on the same tree are not exactly the same. So you wanna make sure that you look at more than one leaf. As you can see by this example here, here's a black oak, here's a black oak, and here's a black oak. Look how different these leaves look. So you've got very shallow lobes right here and very deep, you got deep sinuses with these big protruding lobes on this one in the middle. And then here, the, this one's shiny. I mean, their surfaces don't even look the same. And that's all from black oak. Well, maybe not from the same tree. It is from black oak. So you want to make sure you look at numerous leaves. And I'll say this holds true also for our, our needle type trees, our conifers are, um, that we have out there because we have a set of trees that have needle like leaves. And those we also call conifers sometimes. Um, and those, you want to make sure you look at multiples of those because sometimes needles fall off. So you want to look at numerous sets of those as well. Okay, so when we're using a, um, a tree key, the first characteristic that we're, it's going to ask us about is, does that tree have needles or does that tree have broad leaves? So our needle trees, bald cypress would be an example of it. This is the leaf of the tree. And um, then 
and I won't, this is not the best example because this is a deciduous <laughs> um, conifer. So a bald cypress is our only deciduous conifer in the state that loses all of its needles in the fall and grows all new needles in the spring. But for the rest of our um, conifers or needle type trees, they'll re retain those needles for about three to four years and they slowly drop off throughout over the course of those three to four years. So it looks like those trees are evergreens, that they never lose their leaves. Our other set of trees here are that we have in Kentucky are our broadleaf trees. And these are just two good examples, a shellbark hickory and a bur oak, a nice big broadleaf, mostly Almost all of them are deciduous. They're going to changing color right now. Those leaves are going to drop and then they'll grow new leaves in the spring. An exception to this one, two, I can think of two exceptions off the top of my head would be our American holly. It is a broad leaf, but it is an evergreen and it will retain its leaves throughout the year. And another one that we'll find in areas, especially it's planted because we're a little north of its range would be the um, Southern Magnolia, an evergreen broad leaf as well. And we, like I said, we are mostly a state made up of deciduous broadleaf trees since we're an oak hickory forest. But we will talk a real quick about our conifers. Won't spend a lot of time on them because we only have eight native species to um, this state. We have a lot that have been planted, but we have eight native species and we're focusing on native trees today. Like I said, sometimes we call our needle bearing trees conifers because they're cone bearing. Um, in forestry, sometimes we call them softwoods as well, and we call um, our deciduous broadleaf trees hardwoods. Um, we won't go too much into that, but for our conifers or needle type bearing trees, we've got different kinds of leaves. So there's scale like leaves, and those are little overlapping compressed um, needles essentially, or we've got single type um, needles. So the needles are going to be in singles on that stem all by themselves. And then we've got needles that are in groups um, and they're held together like with a little, um, it's a woody corky cup that they sit in, it looks like. And those can have be two up to five. And let's take a look at a few of them. So here are two of ours that have our compressed like overlapping scale like needles our um, Eastern red cedar, the one here on the top, or our Northern white cedar. And to tell these two apart, the new growth on the Eastern red cedar is gonna be this prickly, it'll have prickly um, scale-like needles, whereas we don't have that on our Northern white cedar. So those are the two with our um, scale-like needles. Now here's two that, oops, I better go back so you can see them. The, these two are single, the needles appear in singles right there on the stem all by themselves. One is our Eastern Hemlock, um, lovely tree, and then our Bald Cypress, which we discussed earlier as being our um, deciduous conifer. So needles are in singles, not groups. Now the, the rest of these are our pines and our needles are in groups. So we've got Eastern White Pine, um, really lovely tree. Um, its needles are in groups of five. It has the most needles. So in that little woody, if I'm down my cursors down on there, that little woody cup right there, there's five needles grouped together. We also call that bundle or woody cup a fascicle. Um, but that's what it is. It's just a bundle and white pine is in groups of five. One way to always remember that is white and there's five letters in white. So white pine, really a nice tree. It's planted a lot. It's a fast grower and um, gets big, gets pretty big really fast. So a lot of people like that and um, especially in home landscaping if they're trying to create some kind of barrier. And then we have pitch pine. Pitch pine is in groups of three. Um, and if anybody watched the tree of the week, we did pitch pine no, we did short leaf pine, sorry, haven't done pitch pine yet. Um, so it's in groups of three, and uh, always be in those groups of three, and there'll be about three inches long. And then the other tree that looks very much like pitch pine, the bark and stuff looks pretty similar, is our short leaf pine. These two pines would be definitely two of our timber pines. They're traditional southern yellow pines, but we do have them in the state. And short leaf pine is in twos and threes. So this is why it's important that you look at sets, multiple sets of needles or leaves in this case to make sure you see um, you're seeing everything because if you just look at one set and you see three you're like oh, I've got a pitch pine when in actuality if you would have looked a few more you would have found oh I actually have a short leaf pine um, and then we've got our Virginia pine and it's our uh, pine tree that has needles in groups of two and they're actually twisted um, a lot of times so that makes it kind of easy to pick out we also call Virginia pine scrub pine it's the one that's going to grow where a lot of other trees can't grow 
Um, so Virginia pines in groups of two. So we've got those eight native ones to worry about um, here in the state. All the rest of those 120 are going to be our uh, broadleaf trees. And so some of the broadleaf characteristics that we're going to go over our leaf arrangement, because just like with the our conifer trees, we talked about how the needles, either they were scale or they were needle-like, um, and if they were grouped or single. Well, we've got characteristics for broadleaf trees too. So we're going to talk about leaf arrangement, what that means, leaf form, leaf margin, a little bit on leaf tips, and leaf base can also be a good characteristic and used in identification as well. But I wanted to also point out that we're lucky this time of year because the buds are also very helpful in identifying trees, even with the leaves on there. The buds are simply the location of the new stems, fruits, and leaves. And we've got, I like this photograph here. It's a good one. It's of a black walnut. We've got this, um, our terminal bud. That's the one at the end of the shoot. It's responsible for that elongation. It's going to have next, some next year's growth, next year's leaves in it. And then we've got our lateral buds. And it's our lateral buds, these ones that are down on the sides of the twig, that are going to help us determine leaf arrangement and leaf form. But I'll point out this. So there's a lateral bud, and that's got all of the stuff in it for next year's leaf. And right below it is the leaf scarf, where the leaf has already come off its fall or um, when this photo was taken, and the leaf has already dropped off. But those are going to be important in telling us if it's a leaf arrangement and telling us leaf form. Is it a simple leaf or a compound leaf? Buds are really, really important for leaf form. So just look at a few buds here. I love that one. This is on our pawpaw. It looks like a fuzzy um, moth's antenna. We've got these two little guys side by side on this red maple. Um, we got uh, this nice little pointy bud here. We got these are quite large. These are on our buckeyes, which have it's a compound, a somewhat largish compound leaf. So it's got a pretty large bud there. I'm going to love this one. This is our from our state tree, the yellow poplar. It's got a duck's bill. It looks like a little duck's bill on there. Very distinctive um, um, terminal bud. And then wrapping up with our uh, American beech. Nice. It looks almost like a thorn. And we always call it like a little cigar, but on the American beech. So just a few buds. Okay, so we talked about leaf. Um, what kinds of leaves we have. Do you have a needle leaf or do you have a broad leaf? The next question that you're going to run into on a key is going to ask you about how those leaves are arranged on the twig. And we've got three arrangements. We've got opposite, we've got world, and we've got alternate. So let's start with opposite. Our oppositely arranged um, leaves, as you can see, they grow right across from each other on that stem. It's like right across the street. And the nice thing about this is we only have four groups of tree. Now, there are more than four species, but we have four groups of trees that have oppositely arranged leaves. We have our maples, ash, dogwood, and buckeye. So if you can remember that mnemonic mad buck, you can remember the trees that have oppositely arranged, the native trees that have oppositely arranged leaves. And so those guys are going to be right across the stem from one another, maples, ash, dogwood, and buckeye. All the remaining ones are going to be, with one exception, are going to be alternate. And so these, the leaves are staggered on that stem. You got a leaf down here, you move up that stem, you got another leaf there. If we were to continue it up, there'd be another leaf here. So those are alternately arranged leaves. And the majority of our trees have alternately arranged leaves. And then we do have a, one species that has whorled leaves. And so those little guys are whorled all the way around that stem. There'll be three little leaves, well, kind of large leaves actually on a catalpa that are whorled right across all the way around that stem. So let's look at a few. So here's some real life pictures. And here you've got opposite, um, alternately arranged, sorry, alternately arranged um, leaves. The leaves are off. They pulled them off so you can actually see the buds. And over here, we've got um, our oppositely arranged, as you can see, right across from each other on that stem. All right, so now the next question that a key, now that you've answered that, if you have oppositely or alternately arranged leaves, the next question that a dichotomous key is going to ask you about is leaf form. And this is, remember I said the bud was really important in leaf form. And this is trying to figure out if you have a simple leaf or if you have a compound leaf, and you're going to look for the bud. So you see you have this one blade, 
and you go down the little um, leaf stem and you find I have a bud right there. So from that bud, you've got one stem and one blade. So this is a simple leaf. Now, so that's pretty easy and, and, a, and a majority, a big chunk of our trees are simple and um, have simple leaf form. But you come up to this tree right here and you're looking at, you think these are the leaves, you're looking at the base, but you're not finding any buds, so you keep moving down the stem and you find that the bud is down here. So what you actually have is a compound, in this instance, a palmately compound leaf made up of five leaflets. So these, this whole thing collectively is known as a leaf and these are the leaflets because there are not buds at the base of a leaflet. The bud is at the base of the leaf. So this is, buds are very important for leaf form. In the springtime, it can be a little challenging right as those leaves come out because the trees haven't usually set bud. Um, but this time of year, it's, it's much easier. So now let's look over at this one that says pinately compound. So we look at the base of these and I'm clicking, there's no buds popping up anywhere. I keep moving down this stem and I find that my bud is all the way down here. So this whole thing is collectively the leaf and it's made up of two, four, six, eight, 10, 11 leaflets. And a really good example of this would be um, uh, our hickories, they have um, pinately compound leaves, black walnut, pinately compound leaf. Um, so made up of multiple leaflets and you can tell it because the bud's all the way down here. Now let's come over to this behemoth. And if you're looking at the base of these, what we think are the leaves, because we're checking them all, there are no buds. So we get down here thinking, okay, I've got a pinately compound leaf. And you look down here, there are no buds there. You move way down this big long stem and you find that bud is all the way down there at the bottom. And so this is a bipinately or doubly pinately compound leaf and it's made up of all of these leaflets. And we've got a couple examples of this. Um, Kentucky coffee tree is a great one. It has a great big leaf. So a real good example of a bipinately or doubly pinately compound leaf. But we don't have a whole lot of species that have that kind of um, leaf form. All right, so leaf form, the third thing you're gonna run into in a dichotomous key. So let's just look at some live pictures here. So we've got buds, we've circled our buds, and we've got a stem. And then from that stem, I have one blade. So this is simple leaf form. We've got just the one blade. All right, so now let's look here. So if we looked at the base of these guys, I'm not really seeing any buds um, there, even on this one. But it, notice all the way down here, there's a great big bud there, one there, and one there. So we know this is a compound leaf because there were no buds at the base of these leaflets. This, but instead, this is a big giant black walnut leaf. And walnuts tend to have very large buds. It's a large leaf, um, so pretty easy to see. So compound leaf form. All right, the fourth thing that we'll talk about, and this will be the last one that we go over characteristics before we jump into the key, are leaf margins. So the next thing that, now that it's narrowed you down and you know the tree key has gotten you through what kind of leaf, it's gotten you through leaf arrangement, and it's gotten you through leaf form, now it's gonna ask you about leaf margins. And so we got a couple different arrangements of leaf, different types of leaf margins. You've got entire or unlobed, meaning there's no serrations. It's a nice smooth edge. There's no indentations or lobes. And um, this little guy is a great example of that, nice and smooth. So is this magnolia down here? This, um, this appears to be a, an umbrella magnolia down here at the bottom. Nice smooth margins, no indentations. So that would be entire leaf margins are unlobed. Then we've got lobed leaf margins. And the lobe is referring to the part that's sticking out. The indentations are called the sinuses. And those sinuses can vary from being kind of shallow to being very deep like this one here in the bottom. Um, so you can have leaves that are lobed as well. And counting lobes is a lot of times is a good characteristic of species and what the edges of those, the tips of those lobes looked like. You all probably recognize these as oaks. The one on the top um, has bristle tips on the tips of those lobes, so that indicates it is a red oak. Now, not all oak leaves will be lobed, but our red oaks will have bristle tips, even the ones that are not lobed. Most of our oaks have lobed leaves, so we have a few that don't. But red oaks will have a bristle tip at the tip of their lobe or the tip of their leaf. 
Now this one down here is our white oak. It has rounded lobes. All of the white oaks have rounded lobes. We have, I think, about eight different kinds of white oaks and 13 different kinds of red oaks in this state. But so we have um, our rounded lobes on our white oaks. And um, so that's a good characteristic to use in identifying red versus white oak to at least get you down to that. But this is what it refers to when lobed margins. And then there's serrated margins. And serrated, D Doug McLaren, who I work with a lot, he does a lot of tree identification. He always likes to think about knives. Think of a tool in your kitchen that you might have um, that has serrations. And yes, you go to knife. Even your butter knives usually have a little serration on it, very fine teeth, or something much larger um, like a bread knife, which has much broader um, serrations on it. And so leaves, depending on the species, will have um, some kinds of serrations, those that are serrated. Now, you can have leaves that are lobed and serrated. So here we've got, um, this got our red maple here. It's made up of three lobes. So these lobes look a little different than the oak ones. These aren't quite as rounded. It's more of a V-shaped um, sinus there, but it has three lobes. And you can see on the edge of the leaf, there's some kind of irregular teething or serrations going on along the edge of that leaf. So it can be lobed and serrated as well. That's just one of, the things, one of those things that look nice and close. All right, hope everybody remembers all that. We've got a test time. Let's see how, how well you'll do. Granted, I can't see any answers here, but you all can be saying them out loud. Our first question, is this a conifer or a broad leaf? And I hope everybody said conifer. Yes, this is one of our needle type trees. And um, it's one of our pines. In fact, it's a white pine. If you were to count all of those needles in that bundle, there's five of them right there. So this is a conifer. All right, are the leaves opposite or are the leaves alternate? Well, we can't really see the leaves, but we can see the buds and we can see the leaf stems. And so we see that these buds and the leaf stems are opposite from one another. Awesome, awesome. All right, let's try this one. Are these alternate or opposite? So let's look close. We've got a bud and we've got a leaf there. We move up, we've got a bud and a leaf. Good indicate this is an alternately arranged tree. So our, as you can see, the buds and the leaves are staggered on that stem. Okay, so this is a good one. Simple or compound. Now this one, you can actually see the bud. So if we look here, are we seeing any buds at the base of what we think are the leaves as we keep moving down, getting closer to this other stem? In fact, no, we see that our bud is down here. So we have a compound leaf. This whole thing is a compound leaf. And this, with these sulfur yellow buds, that's a, a bitter nut hickory. Okay, leaf margins. Lobed are entire. Hopefully everybody said lobed. Yes, we clearly lobed. This was the example we looked at with our white oak. Nice um, big round lobes with deep sinuses on those. Okay. Now I always got to have one of these in there. Is this statement true or false? This leaf is lobed, serrated, and compound. Do we see lobing? No. Do we see serrations? Is it compound? I see a bud, a stem, and one blade. So this statement is false. This leaf is none of those. Awesome. Leaf margin again, entire or serrated. Well, this was our example for entire, so no serrations and no lobing. It's entire. Great. Oh, which of the following does not fit the sequence? A, B, C, or D? Hopefully everybody said C, and it doesn't fit the sequence because all of these have serrated leaf margins, and this guy is not serrated at all. This is from our pawpaw. All right, now this is a super abbreviated example of a key, just trying to get it all on one page, just so you can kind of see what we're going to go through using our tree manual here in a minute. So starts at A um, or one, or, or if it says start here, wherever it says to start in your dichotomous key. The first question, does the tree have needles? Does the tree have leaves? Remember, that's always that first question, figuring out what kind of leaf, needle type or broad leaf. And if you guys look here, hopefully everybody's saying B. It has broad leaves. So now we go down to the next set of um, statements or questions. It asks, are the leaves opposite? Are the leaves alternate? Well, let's look closely. We've got, they're circled. We got a leaf here, staggered a leaf here, staggered a leaf there. 
And that says that hopefully everybody saw that, that those leaves are alternately arranged, leaf arrangement. Now we know this next one's gonna be asking a question about leaf form. So we go down to C, because that's where the key has told us to go, and it asks if the leaves are simple or are the leaves compound? Well, we see, you can't really see the bud, <clears throat> but there is a little bud right here, and you've got a stem and one blade. So that indicates we have a simple leaf. So now we're gonna go down to F and we have our answer, that we have a service berry right there. So that's a super abbreviated way that it works. Usually a key, you're gonna go through multiple pages and we're gonna practice doing um, one here in just a second. All right, so yes, we have our service berry. Okay, so let's ID this tree. Let me get a little sip. All right, <clears throat> so in the tree finder, little tree manual that I showed you it on page five start here the first question asks if the tree has needles or if the tree has leaves broad leaves well hopefully everybody's saying this one has broad leaves so we're going to go over to page 14 remember what that little symbol looks like it looks like that a little stylized tree flip over to page we'll flip over to page 14 and we'll see it's the bracket at the top and it asks if the leaves, now remember it's arrangement, so you figured out you've got needles or leaves, now it's going to ask about arrangement. <coughs> if the leaves or buds grow opposite, and it even gives you a picture of what that looks like, or if the leaves or buds grow alternately like this, gives you a picture. So if we look at our example over here, we've got a leaf here, and we stagger down, there's another leaf, stagger another leaf, very very clearly this one has, hopefully everybody saw that it has alternately arranged leaves. So now we look at that alternately arranged little um, logo or diagram and we take that over to page 21 and it's the bracket in the middle this time. Now it's going to ask us about leaf form, always that third question, leaf form, is it simple or compound? So it says if the leaves are compound composed of several leaflets and if you forget it, tell, it explains to you, you can tell leaves from leaflets because there is no bud at the base of a leaflet or if the leaves are simple and not composed of leaflets. Well if we look here, we've got, you can see the little bud while it is a small bud, you can see it. The blade, we've got our stem and then we've got just one blade. So hopefully everybody saw that this was a simple leaf form. So now we'll look for that simple leaf form little um, diagram and take that over to page 28. And it's the bracket at the bottom. So um, you're looking at that simple leaf form and it asks now about leaf margins. It asks if the leaf has neither teeth nor lobes, we want to go to the next page, or if the teeth, if the leaf has teeth of any kind or a wavy margin or lobe, go to 33. Well, hopefully you see that this one has no lobes or teeth. In fact, it was our example of our entire leaf. So we'll take that simple um, note, that entire leaf over to the next page onto 29 and the bracket at the top. Now it's asking us a little bit, we didn't go over this, but we did a little bit with the red oak. It asks us if the leaf is tipped with a single bristle, like the tip of a needle, or if the leaf has no bristle at its tip, the leaf may be pointed or not. Well, this leaf is pointed, but we don't see any kind of bristle tip coming off of that like we do on our that red oak or this diagram right here. So we're gonna, hopefully you all see that, that it is, does not have a bristle tip. So we're gonna take that unbristle tip symbol over to the next page on page 30. And it's the bracket at the top. And it's asking us if the, something about the shape of the leaf. If the leaf is heart shaped with veins branching from the base, or if the leaf is not heart shaped. Well, this one looks somewhat heart shaped to me. We got the nice point down here, maybe not super broad at the top, but let's look at the vein question. With the veins branching from the base, all of the veins in that leaf are branching from that base right there. And you can really see that it shows up nicely. So that tells us that we have a red bed, a Circus canadensis. And you can even see, compare your, your um, um, sample to the drawings that they have right here. So our um, Circus canadensis, our red bud, eastern red bud. 
It's a great little um, understory tree. It's a great landscape tree. It's planted a lot. Um, beautiful spring flowers, one of the earliest to flower. And now this time of year, we're seeing the heart-shaped leaves and their uh, pea pods because it is in the legume or the Fabaceae family. So it is a legume and has pea pods on it. So our eastern redbud. Let's see, let's do one more real quick. I wanted you all to get a chance to do um, a slightly different leaf. Um, so here we go back to page five. This is our new sample right here. So it asks us again something about what kind of leaves we have. Are they needle-like leaves or does the tree have broad leaves? Hopefully everybody sees this one has broad leaves. So we'll remember our broad leaf symbol over to page 14 and it's the bracket at the top. Now it's asking us about leaf arrangement again. If the leaves or buds grow opposite like this, diagram shows you a little drawing again, or if the leaves or buds grow alternately like this. Well, <clears throat> so this one, if you look here, you might think that this does grow oppositely, but you know what? There's not a bud there. My bud's down here and down here. So sure enough, yep, these are oppositely arranged leaves. Okay, so this is one of ours that oppositely arranged and hopefully everybody remembers our oppositely arranged trees, maple, ash, dogwood, buckeye. So we've got a maple, ash, dogwood, or buckeye here. So let's take our oppositely arranged branching symbol um, down below. Now it's asking us about leaf form. If the leaves are compound composed of several leaflets, again, it tells you that you can tell leaves from leaflets because there's no bud at the base of a leaflet or if the leaves are simple, not composed of leaflets. Well, let's look at a little better, closer up picture to see that. So what we see is there seems to be, there's no bud here, which we said we'd looked at that when we were trying to make sure we got our arrangement correct, but instead there is a bud down here. So that makes this whole thing a compound leaf because our bud is down here with the stem and there are three leaflets on this. So this is a compound leaf. I wanted you all to get to see a compound leaf. So we're looking at our compound leaf symbol and we take it, it says go below, it's that bracket of below and it says if um, the five or more leaflets radiate from one point like we see right there, or if the leaflets do not radiate from one point or if there are only three leaflets. Well, this is, can be a little tricky because you think, well, maybe they do radiate from the same point, but it says right there, or if there are only three leaflets and we have only three leaflets and that's looking at multiple sets of leaves. One, two, three, one, two, three. So, and, and the, you had to have five or more radiating from the same point. So we want to look at our symbol there. That's the, like the pinnately compound symbol. Take that over to page 16. That's the bracket at the top, and it asks if the leaflets are of different sizes and shapes, or if the leaflets are of similar size and shape. Well, when we look at our sample here, these are clearly of different sizes and different shapes. In fact, this one's got lobes on it, and this one right here does not. And this top leaf is actually larger than those two on the side. So we have a box elder, our Acer Nagundo. It is one of our maple trees, and it's a maple that has a compound leaf. A lot of times some people will see this and confuse it with poison ivy as well because it has the leaves, the three leaves, but it is box elder. So hopefully everybody was able to get those. I know those were quick, but just to kind of introduce you to this dichotomous key, a little more robust than that little one we did in, in the beginning. But to show you the um, box elder real quick, it is uh, one of the trees that we find growing along our streams. It likes its roots in the water. It likes to be wet, its feet wet, as we always say. A lot of people consider the tree a little weedy. It doesn't probably, as you can see here, some of the best growth form, but it is an important tree along our waterways. It's good at stabilizing soil, and it's a good wildlife food. It's a prolific cedar, so it provides a lot of um, samaras, these paired samaras for our wildlife. So while we still a good tree, our box elder. All right, hopefully seeing some of those, um, if you've seen a tree, you've done a di used a dichotomous key, it was a good refresher. If you never had, um, hopefully it was a good introduction and hopefully you all will get the opportunity to maybe get a, a dichotomous key and practice using that while we still have leaves out. 
Um, like I said, you can order the tree manual, um, the little green tree manual from Amazon for about $5. There are some online resources as well. We've got um, iNaturalist. This is a downloadable app, free app for your phone. Now, this is not a dichotomous key. This is more of a, you snap a picture of it, and then it's going through this huge database to find matches, and it's going to spit out ten five to ten possibilities for you. And you're going to look at those to see which one looks most closely like whatever tree you're identifying. So it is not a dichotomous key, but it can be handy. And when you're out in the field, you've got your phone. It's also useful for more than just trees. You can use iNaturalist for um, insects, mushrooms, um, mosses even. So just all kinds of different things, even birds too. Um, there is a, an online tree key that you can use. It's Virginia Tech Tree ID. They also have one you can download on your phone as well. Um, it can be a little cumbersome because it's got trees of North America in there and we've got mm, seven eight hundred different species so there's a lot in there to choose from but it's kind of nice if you've brought your sample in or you've got um, you've taken a picture of it you can sit down um, at Virginia Tech Tree ID and go through their dichotomous key and they'll have it somewhat visually driven there's some a few photos but a lot of its words and then they'll kind of spit out at the very end usually four or five possible um, answers Arbor Day tree identification. It's again an online key, not as robust as Virginia Tech. Um, it's much, it's a little more maybe user friendly, um, but it, it's usable too. And then we have uh, the UK Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. We have tree ID videos that Doug McLaren put together. He goes over some of these different characteristics that we look at in identifying broadleaf trees. And then we've also got our UK Forestry Natural Resources Extension YouTube channel. And there, on there, we do I do a tree of the week every week. And we've got, I think we're up to 25 trees so far. While it doesn't help you identify it, it's going to give you a lot more information about that tree that you have identified. And then there's native trees of Kentucky that the university's um, horticulture department has. And they have about 80 different fact sheets on native trees of Kentucky. And it's um, a very useful, lots of great information, some good fun facts in there too. So some good tree ID resources out there as well. Um, but again, the, the one that we talked about was the tree finder, the little green manual. You can get that off of Amazon um, as well. All right, I wanted to mention our upcoming programs um, from UK Forestry and Natural Resources Extension. So tomorrow you've got the opportunity to join Dr. Ellen Crocker with um, Are My Woods Healthy at 11 o'clock till noon. And then following that, um, uh, you can join Megan and with uh, Common Landscape Tree Health Issues. Both of those are tomorrow back to back, talking about some of the, the forest health issues and tree health issues as well for those that are interested. And then on Wednesday, we've got um, From the Woods, our video program that we do every week at 11 o'clock. We have a tree week special, and it's gonna be a great special. Um, uh, Dr. Crocker's actually gone out to a nursery to talk with people about what kinds of things we wanna look for in purchasing trees and matching trees, right tree, right space um, type stuff. So, and then a little bit about tree planting. So Wednesday ought to be a great show. And tree of the week this week is Burr Oak. And then on Thursday, we wanted to bring in wildlife as well, because as we talked about, trees are um, very important habitat, not only as homes, but providing food for our, <clears throat> our wildlife. And we had Dr. Matt Springer is going to be bringing us trees for birds. So those trees that are very beneficial um, for birds and how birds utilize trees. And then on Friday, wrapping it up with um, Billy Thomas, and he's going to talk about tree and wildlife assistance for homeowners and landowners. So if you've got questions about your trees or wildlife um, or your woodland, um, he's going to help you kind of navigate trying to find some of that assistance. So hopefully you can join us again this week for some more of our programs. Um, and I'm glad you joined us today. I did want to share a few Tree Week links. Um, and so if you want to follow the urban forest initiatives, um, which is the, they're from the University of Kentucky, out of the University of Kentucky, a multi-departmental group that have put together um, this tree week over the past couple of years. This is all they're doing. Um, and they have the accounts to stay updated on recent events and postings. You can check them out on Facebook and on Instagram. 
And if you're doing any activities, because there's a lot of opportunities to do activities like tree planting um, during the week that you can log that activity using <clears throat> the hashtag tree week Lex um, and you can post it, log it there, or you can log that activity if you're in the LFUCG in the Lexington Fayette Urban County area with the Lexington Fayette Urban County area at that site right there. All right, I know it was quick, but um, hopefully, and then we stop screen sharing. Hopefully um, it was helpful, beneficial, and I think it was a great way to kick off Tree Week. I'm excited and hopefully you all get the opportunity to get out in to the woodlands um, or in your neighborhood. I mean, the leaves look great out there. This has been a, a really nice fall, so we're super excited about that. And um, let me see, it looks like if I've got any questions. Oh, nice and bit. <laughs> yes, Robin Kimmer, I also had her, um, I, where I did summer camp, she taught my um, restoration ecology class. She's awesome. Um, will the recordings of the webinars be available later? Yes, Dawn. Yep, they will be available. Um, Renee is recording once we shut down. Um, they should pop us over the recording. Great. Let's see if I've got any of that's in the questions. Let's see what's in chat. Um, You're good on chat. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay, perfect. Well, again, thanks for joining me today with tree identification and kicking off sort of the third day of kicking off tree week. Um, and I hope, I hope it's been helpful. And um, I hope it's kind of broken down how you can make, take, go out and identify our 120 different trees out there, but, but take it into smaller um, bites with our, uh, using that dichotomous key. So again, happy tree week. Enjoy. And hopefully see some of you all on Wednesday. <laughs>